of what I want to address. I want to address the dimensions of genocide, uh, really try to investigate what uh, the complexity of what genocide looks like on the ground in East Turkestan beyond the ways in which we know and understand it today. There's a lot of cutting edge technological uh, dimensions to the genocide that are seldom discussed in the popular discourse uh, that I'd like to sort of, uh, you know, interrogate with the time, within the time we have. I also want to talk about the, the globalization of Chinese terror and the way in which China is exporting its, its tyranny, its technological authoritarianism uh, all over the world, but specifically into Muslim majority countries. And then I'll talk a bit about China in the Muslim world. And I want to close, uh, if time allows, inshallah, with some, with some action steps that we can all walk away with today to think about what we can do as individuals working for governments, transnational organizations, and in my case, um, independent academics. So who am I? Uh, I'm a law professor in the United States. Um, I spend a lot of my time teaching constitutional law in the United States. Um, I also examine uh, the intersection between technology, law, and policy. And um, I'm also a public intellectual. I write for the New York Times, the Washington Post, but also many of you may know me from social media as well. So what is, what is genocide? When we think about genocide, again, I can't see the slides on my, uh, my computer now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tilt and just speak this way so I can see them on the slide uh, be behind me. So there are various definitions of what genocide means that are uh, crafted by transnational organizations, individual governments, but what we know is that the enforcement, the political enforcement of genocide is highly politicized. It's largely contingent on state interests. It's largely contingent with political interests in which crises, which humanitarian crises are actually dubbed and branded as genocide is highly aligned with what states want to accomplish and in line with uh, various state interests. However, there is a sort of universal uh, global definition of what genocide means, and it's comprised of two uh, elements, if you will. The first element is there has to be an intent on the part of the perpetrators, specifically state governments, to inflict mass violence on a people. The second element is to destroy a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. So when we think about genocide within the context of East Turkestan, the traditional definition of genocide is clearly established. The threshold for genocide is met uh, through a range of horrors that we see in real time today. Obviously, we see it with uh, the concentration camps, a broad network of concentration camps within East Turkestan, where uh, an estimate of 5 million people have traveled within those prison camps beyond. That is just the tip of the sort of genocidal, uh, you know, iceberg, if you will, of what's taking place in uh, East Turkestan. We see genocide obviously being unleashed in a myriad of ways, in addition to uh, brainwashing of children, um, Communist Party loyalists being stationed. Um, in the homes of, uh, of Uyghur people in East Turkestan, the raising and destruction of mosques that has been discussed, the brainwashing of young children, the harvesting of organs, the forced marriages between Han Chinese men um, and Uyghur women. So traditional genocide obviously is met. Uh, a couple of days ago, we saw how the uh, European Parliament finally passed a resolution calling the Chinese government systematic human rights abuses against the Uyghur as, quote, as crimes against humanity and a serious risk of genocide. So we see positive rhetoric, however, not a full-fledged finding of genocide from the EU parliament. However, there are governments across the world, as we can see from this map. Um, sad to say, many of the governments that we represent here today, many of you are from Arab and Muslim majority governments, are on the wrong side of history. Our government, sadly, are not only silent on the Uyghur genocide, but, but are actually acting uh, in complicity with the Chinese government to advance Uyghur genocide. As we can see from this map, it is largely Western nations that have resolved that the Uyghur crisis meets the threshold of genocide. Muslim majority governments, sadly, again, uh, largely because of economic and political reasons, alignment with Chinese interests and, and their own state interests, are supporting the Chinese genocidal policies. Um, you know, we can be honest, right? Western governments are by no means acting benevolent. Are you going to translate at the end? Uh, Okay, you can translate at the end since, since yeah. we're short on time. My apologies, I'm uh, race through as much information as possible. We know that Western governments are not acting benevolently. They're not acting to save uh, Muslims, right? These are governments that have been uh, highly entrenched in advancing the war on terror. Uh, but they're on the right side of history in this regard because they're opposed, their political interests are opposed 
to that of China. Muslim majority governments uh, sadly take the antithetical perspective and are siding with China. I want to address that in a bit um, and sort of interrogate what we can do as representatives of Muslim governments moving ahead. Uh, but I also want to talk about what genocide looks like with regard to the uh, deployment and the employment of really cutting edge nefarious technologies within East Turkestan that are sort of advancing the, the bounds of genocide in real time today. This is something I call digital authoritarianism, right? Where technologies, facial recognition cameras, algorithms being stationed at checkpoints, roving checkpoints, are able to in real time monitor what Uyghur people, elderly people, adults, children are doing at every step during every minute, every hour of every waking day, following their footsteps, their physical footsteps, but also their virtual footsteps. And technology is enabling the, the entrenchment and the um, seeding of genocidal strategy in a way to deter and prohibit Uyghur people from practicing their cultural uh, customs, but also from practicing religion. So we can see through these technologies, things like the smart city design, for those of you who have traveled through cities like Kashgar and Arunchi, various cities and villages throughout East Turkestan, we know that Chinese police, right? Federal police, but also local police are um, designing these cities in a way where they can monitor everything that an Uyghur individual does within the city, facial recognition cameras at fixed stations, obviously, but also roving cameras that are deployed on what are called skybirds, cameras on the helmets of policemen, again, enable the perpetual and pervasive monitoring uh, of Uyghur in real time, smartphone mining. Obviously, this, this technology that we all use on a daily basis enables state governments, not only the Chinese government, but the US government where I live is also complicit in mass surveillance to actually not only monitor and surveil what we're doing in real time, but something that is far more dangerous It enables governments to ex extract information from our phones, right? So when Uber people are using various social media apps on their phones, whether they're saying, let's say, uh, visiting a app uh, that is um, providing recitals of the Quran, for instance, or uh, WeChat, right, chat apps, that enables the government to take that information out and sort of uh, construct a dossier of what people are doing in real time um, to surveil them. We see facial recognition cameras in the way they work, again, in cities throughout East Turkestan. And these are genocidal technologies. That's why I'm going through this, right? To not only push you to think about genocide in ways that we think about uh, in the traditional sense, but genocide is being advanced with the way technology is being reconfigured and advanced in real time. These technologies are so advanced that they enable facial recognition cameras to hone in on the individual's face, identify an individual who is a subject of interest. And in that moment, right, that technology is interacting with their camera, is interacting with a whole host of information these checkpoints have, mined from the individual in terms of what they've done, where they've traveled, who they've spoken to, have they spoken to individuals beyond East Turkestan, have they spoken to individuals in the West? And if uh, that algorithm processes that they have to stop this individual, the technology is so advanced also that it can differentiate between a Han Chinese person and a Uyghur, uh, Chinese, uh, and a Uyghur individual. It can arrest an individual and build a sort of dossier upon them, produce a dossier uh, upon them in moments time. So a quick example of how this technology works in Urumqi, for instance, Xinjiang, uh, East Turkey, the, the capital, six million identifications were made in the city's 10,000 checkpoints in 24 hours. You can see how efficient, right, how accelerated this technology is to enable a, um, a sort of system of architectural surveillance that advances and intensifies the genocidal strategy uh, of uh, the Chinese government. The bad news is this, and the bad news for us as Muslims in this room and those of you from Muslim majority governments is China is essentially constructing, how much more time do I have? Uh, you have about two minutes. Four minutes? Okay, you looked at me, so I know you touched one minute now. Uh, four minutes, inshallah, so I'll try to get through as much as I can. Um, the bad news is that um, these architectures of surveillance and genocide, which are being perfected in East Turkestan, right? I, I wish I can translate this next phrase, but for those of you who speak English in the room, you can understand. East Turkestan is an incubator, right? It's basically a test center for some of the most nefarious and destructive um, surveillance technologies that are being exported 
across the world. And these technologies, these genocidal technologies, which are coming into Muslim majority countries, places like Egypt, where I'm, my family's from, places like Pakistan, places like India, where we see what's happening in real time with Muslims over there, Malaysia, Indonesia, countries that you come from that are partnering up with China through the, the Belt Road Initiative, right? So we know that this is a system China is constructing right now to basically set up an architecture, a global architecture where, where it can expand and export its products on a world scale. The Digital Silk Road is the technological sort of component or thoroughfare of the Belt Road Initiative where China is advancing these uh, surveillance technologies that I just discussed uh, to countries across the world, um, you know, via, via partnerships which are very parasitic in nature. These partnerships are largely benefiting the Chinese government but are destructive to the host governments that are heavily reliant on China economically. And we see the visual for, way, for how the Belt Road Initiative is being constructed. And we can see in the Middle East, North Africa, uh, and South and East Asia, Right, the Muslim majority governments in the city specifically where these architectures are being constructed in real time and these surveillance technologies are being imported. Right, so the bad news is this, these uh, genocidal technologies that are being pioneered against uh, Uyghur Muslims in East Turkestan are, are coming into Muslim majority societies real time. So when we think about, and this is a really important point, when we think about how we can help the Uyghur people moving ahead, Helping the Uber people in the short term is helping ourselves in the long term because these technologies that are cracking down on the free exercise of Islam, that are cracking down on movements, Islamic movements all over the Muslim uh, world, uh, these technologies that are being advanced in our countries to crush free exercise, to crush the democracy, to crush any form of dissidence against the government are being employed, adopted by governments in Muslim majority countries um, uh, through China. So with this outlook, why would you as religious and state leaders from the Muslim world align yourself with a regime, a Chinese regime, that dehumanizes your fellow Muslims inside of East Turkestan, reviles your faith? Again, we're talking about a government here which is pointedly atheistic and communist, right? So they, they are no friends of Islam uh, by ideology and by practice as we see through the persecution and the genocide of Uyghur. Why would you align yourself with a Chinese regime that only partners with you to further its economic interests and geopolitical interests? Why would you partner with a Chinese regime that will augment authoritarianism and derail Islamic practice and organizing in your home country? So as much as we want to align ourselves with the Uyghur people, we have to ask ourselves, coming from various Muslim majority countries, I come from the United States, where we have a population of 8 million Muslims, where we have been the victims of a 20 year long war on terror, Islamophobia, obviously that has been very destructive in Muslim American communities. So. We must turn the tide toward condemning China, um, which is ca committing genocide, and cast it as a global pariah, right? This is what we have to do. And with the time remaining, I want to go through some strategies uh, that we can employ in the short term. This has been a great conference. I've really enjoyed it. One, one minor critique that I have of the kind conference is that we're all talking about very aspirational pie in the sky sort of objectives. But what I want to push us to think about is what can we do in the short term? What can we do today? What can we do tomorrow when we leave this conference to directly help the Uber people right now? That is a principal question that we have to ask ourselves. Um, we cannot directly aid Uyghur within East Turkestan, obviously, because of the Chinese regime's iron walls and the disability for us to you know, bring in funds and to bring in resources within the bounds of East Turkestan. So we must work with and empower leadership who are obviously here and we're building relationships with in the diaspora, silencing and disempowering Uyghur in the diaspora, right? So these leadership, uh, Uyghur leadership who are here, they're also targeted by the Chinese government as well as part of their genocidal strategy. So we have to speak up on their behalf and build partnerships in very uh, you know, practical ways. So one practical example that I'll give you is, right now I'm spearheading a fundraiser to help uh, Uyghur orphans and widows in real time. In 12 days we've raised roughly $111,000, $112,000, or roughly 2 million Turkish lira that is directly coming to Uyghur orphans and widows here in the metropolitan Istanbul uh, area. So these are the kind of programs you can launch on the part of your governments, transnational organizations, universities, whatever it is, whether it's financial aid, resources, whatever it might be, direct aid that helps Uyghur leadership in the diaspora, because if they're weakened, they're gonna be disabled from carrying forward this self-determination movement, moving ahead.
Okay, I'm gonna stop there because I'm short on time, but maybe during the Q&A period, I'm happy to discuss some, some middle-term and long-term practical recommendations we can make uh, to further the, the Uber movement for self-determination. Thank you so much.